We're gonna talk about how to talk to people. So one of the things about our job that is so cool is we get to see all kinds of people. Um, but the problem is we get to see all kinds of people. And communicating with them is crucially important. Right? If we don't communicate well, we end up not necessarily getting the information we want. And communication is a complicated thing. Um, you know, any of you in a relationship know communication is a complicated thing, and there are lots of components to it. So we're going to power through a little over 50 slides, and in this handout for you are some suggested phrases you can use that I'm not going to specifically go over in detail because you can read just fine, and my reading them to you is dumb. But the reality is there's certain phrases that are sometimes very helpful to have that we'll go through as we kind of approach this. So we know patients come to the ER for lots of different reasons. Um, sometimes it's because it's convenient. They happen to be there because it's a working mom and her kids are sick and she's now after work. And that's the, the easiest way for her to get seen because she can't get in the doctor's office. Or they think they're having something serious. You may know it's not serious, but they think it's serious. Or what's serious to them may not be serious to you. Breaking an ankle might be really important to somebody who needs to work. Or they have a pain issue. They really need their pain control or they need a prescription refilled. Whatever the reason is, our job is to sort of communicate with them and get the information that we need and not kind of rush to judgment. And one of the things that makes this really helpful when you approach your job is to be very zen about your job, to not rush to judgment, because when you do, you often end up making mistakes if you do that. So communication is key. It is difficult to do in our situation, though. There's lots of noise in the background. There are five new people coming in. You, you are at the bedside of somebody that's not having a critical problem, and you know that 10 minutes from now, there's a code that's going to take you away for half an hour or 45 minutes in that person's bedside. You're have a, you have a lot of juggling you're doing. You have a lot of balls in the air here. That being said, there's still ways to do this that is very effective, that you can really communicate well, that make the patients happy, give you the information that you need, make their families happy, lots of sort of tools you can use in this regard. So let's start with nonverbal communication. It's so funny, Rick kind of thinks the nonverbal communication thing is baloney. I think it's powerful. And if you ever, so you know how powerful nonverbal communication is. Say you're at the airport on your way flying home today. You can, you can not hear the conversation on what's happening, but watch somebody over in a group over there, or a couple that's having something going on, and you know who's having a great day, you know who's having issues between themselves. Watch a television, take t watch TV, and turn off the volume. You don't need words to know what's happening on that screen. Nonverbal communication, from facial expression to how people are using their bodies, is, it turns out it's probably about 40 to 50 percent, maybe even 60 percent of how we communicate, much more important than words. So, and how the patient is communicating to you nonverbally is important, and going back to them. So a lot of communications happens nonverbally. So you can look at someone and know what's wrong. You can tell which person here is bored, which person here is frustrated. You can tell these people. You can tell which one's in a power position, which one. This is the power position, right? The blue suit, the power position. This is the thing that people do to sort of dominate in a situation. Politicians do it all the time. You can watch it on television any day. And facial expressions are very helpful. A word coming out of someone's mouth may be one thing, but if their facial expression is another, now you know some, something's up, something's not quite kosher. You know it in your relationships, it's the same way in the ER. How you, your facial expression comes across is crucial. You need to be sort of open. Not, people aren't going to communicate with somebody who comes in with a big old frown on their face. You need to have open, sort of an open, smiling, you know, please talk to me kind of face. And so if you're coming from a stressful bedside situation or you're coming from a code that was just really terrible and sad, you need a moment to regroup to make sure it's the sort of talk to me face that you have on when you go into a room. So your expressions are really, really important. The other thing is your body movements and posture. Um, that my husband was an ER, a director of his ER for a really long time and had one of the people who worked for him get a whole lot of complaints, despite the fact that this individual was a really, really good practitioner, like a really excellent clinician. And a lot of it turned out to be because of how this person non-verbally communicated. It wasn't the words that this person said, but there was a lot of this when the person basically went into the room and a lot of frowning when the person went into the room or, lo or looking like they were busy, if you know, looking from the side. What you want to do is have an open stance, if you can, just on, at least on the first encounter when you meet somebody, have an open stance pretty much face to face without a side happening here because it gives an impression that you're not that interested. It's an open posture face to face, not arms crossed and make sure your facial expression is okay. It conveys interest and concern. So that, get, that makes the patient un, you know, un, understand initially that you are there to listen to them, really important. And studies basically show that that, that get, conveys a lot more than the words that you say when you initially walk in the room, is what your body posture is. And what you do when you walk in there is important. 
If you instantly walk over to the EHR, if you have a computer in the room because you have to be fast and type while you're doing that, that doesn't convey that you're interested. And what is, re if you want someone to think you're spending a lot of time with them, even though you know you are busy as all heck and you're not in there that long, sit down. So take a chair and just sit. When they've actually measured the amount of time that you spend in there and the amount of time people estimate that you're in the room, they always overestimate the amount of time if you're actually sitting when you talk to them rather than looking like you're kind of too busy and standing there halfway out the room. So sitting is a very helpful way to convey that you're in there a long time, even when you may not be. Remember, watch your body posture, watch crossed arms, watch one hip jutted out. This is the I'm kind of pissed off thing, right? Across the room, that looks like you're unhappy. Be careful how you use your posture. And be careful with your gestures. This kind of gesture tells people that you're judging them and you're poking them. Basically, this kind of gesture isn't great. Open gestures are very useful for people to want to communicate to you. So use open gestures rather than pointing, not particularly helpful. And eye contact turns out to be vital. I love this poster. Look at the dachshund. I think that is absolutely hilarious. Don't make contact. Don't, 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 don't. I love that poster. I think that's hilarious. When you make eye contact, though, be careful where you put it. So eye contact turns out people, th that turns out to be of all the things you do non-verbally, that turns out to be the thing that patients will trust you or not the most based on how, what kind of eye contact you have. And you know, the person that's not, even when you're talking to somebody, a friend or a patient, when the person's not looking you in the eye, sums up. Sums funny. Something's funny. They're either scared to tell you something, they're not telling you the truth, something's funny. So it goes both ways, right? You're distracted, you're not paying attention. So eye contact is key. And the eye contact that you really wanna do, so to see the pictures at the bottom, the one on the right is the social eye contact. This is what's happening in all the bars in Las Vegas. The eye contact is going from here to here, to here to here, this is where it's all going. That's not the eye contact you make as a professional. As a professional, the eye contact that you really wanna make is here, right in the middle. This says, I'm interested in you as a person, and I'm going to look right here in the middle. You don't stare them down, but you basically look right here in the middle. You don't look at their forehead. That's the business thing. I'm paying attention to you when I'm really not. What you're really paying attention is right here. You're looking right in the middle of their face. And this is it. When they've done studies, this has actually been studied, when they've done studies looking at patients' perceptions of you and how interested you are and how much you care about their problem, it's the eye contact that turns out to be the most important thing. So just remember that's part of it. Space is another one. So, and you know this on the receiving end, right? Somebody who gets into your space, something's funny. They're, they either have a sort of a psychiatric disorder where they don't get space, or they're really angry and they're in your space, or they're really needy and they're in your space. It goes both directions. So if a patient gets in your space, something's up. Clue into that, and vice versa. You don't want to get into their space. It's called there's, for certain zones that are safe. And use your voice. It turns out your voice, especially if there's an issue, you've got a patient that's upset, you have a consultant that's being a jerk on the phone, how you use your voice is critically important. One of my favorite things to do in the ER, I love talking down the crazy person or the violent person or the agitated person. I absolutely love it. I just think it's the funnest thing ever. It's like the, you do the whisper. I just love that. So you, and you use your voice. Somebody's yelling at you. You just basically take your voice and you down. And it's remarkable what kind of attention you get. So just make it, don't, you don't escalate it. Use your voice. But if you need to be firm, it's like, sir, no, I really need you to sit down because we need to talk about this. This is very important. Use, use your voice. It's so powerful. Use it. And all these things that are, are not actually words, these are all nonverbal communication, turn out to be really, really helpful to you going both directions. Make sure that you're, you're paying attention to what the patient's saying as well. And I don't know why we have two sets of those. We'll skip that. Touch is important. Rick mentions this when he does the original boot camp course as far as introducing yourself to a patient. Appropriate medical touch turns out to be a very important way for, to convey that you're interested in somebody. So it is wonderful to go shake someone's hand or touch their arm. I do the pulse thing. I come in and I say, hi, I'm Dr. Fierenbaumer. Really good to meet you, Mrs. Gonzalez. And I basically reach over and feel their pulse. So I know what their medical can, I can tell if they're tachycardic, I can feel what their skin feels like. It's a wonderful way to kind of get some a beginning medical information and to let them know that you're interested. One of the things to do both in, in receiving information from a patient and conveying it is to make sure the nonverbal and the verbal match. It turns out, and this is, this, in your personal relationships, that's a kind of a useful thing to do. If someone's saying, yeah, I think you're the best person ever, no, nah, that doesn't match. Something's wrong here. So if the patient's saying, no, I'm really, really fine. I don't really need anything. I'm really, really fine. They're not really, really fine. 
something's not right. So if it doesn't match, really pay attention to that. It gives you an idea of what's going on here. So again, you're going to use your nonverbal stuff and basically watch your body language. When you read these inconsistencies, address them with patients. So it's say, you, you know, you, you're telling me you're not having pain, but boy, you look like you're uncomfortable. You give them an opening to actually talk to you about it, it's fine, and trust your instincts. If your instincts say it's a dangerous situation, it probably is, get out of there. If your instincts say, this patient's sicker than I think, even though they're, not, they're saying they're okay, I think they're sicker, trust your instincts, it makes sense. That's the nonverbal. But then you have to integrate the verbal. And one of the things about integrating the verbal is active listening. And I'll tell you, active listening is super hard. It is really hard. It's hard to do in a busy ER. It is super hard. I'll tell you, as a teacher who's been teaching for 30 years, it's really hard in a busy ER for me to sit and listen to the presentation of a medical student or an intern or somebody where I've got a lot of distractions going on. You have to really, really focus to be an active listener. And I'll tell you, in an ER, effective listening, it's really hard when you know there's a bunch of stuff going on. Your charting's happening. They're waiting for a consultant to call you back. There's a nurse that's been paging you a million times. And this, you need to pay attention here. So one of the things to do is to don't interrupt, listen, and paraphrase. If you, that thing we talked about in the tricks of the trade, paraphrase. If you do find that your attention has drifted and you haven't quite heard, either ask them to repeat what they just said or paraphrase what you've heard and see if there are any gaps. Did I miss anything? Is there anything I should know that beyond that? Ask so that you basically have that. And listen to their words. Okay, listen to what they're saying. Don't pass judgment. Listen to wor their words and try to figure out what it is they're trying to tell you. You, while you're doing that, to make sure that they know you're listening, to be deep, like you would, if you're having coffee with your best friend and they're telling you about the great trip that they just took to Las Vegas, while they took this awesome course to learn about being a good, you know, a good advanced practice clinician, you know, you're gonna be all excited, you're gonna be nodding, it's like, God, that sounds great. That was, a, but that must've been a really great course. That you're gonna be nodding, right? That's what you're gonna wanna do when you interact with the patients as well. It's fine to be a normal person, not just the cl clinician. It's fine to be a normal person. And say, gosh, it's really great. Oh, I just, that, your ring is beautiful. Oh, your husband had that made for you? How great is that? It's a wonderful way to kind of get a rapport with the patients. It's wonderful. And again, repeat back. Make sure that you paraphrase that you're hearing correctly. Sort of three big things when you have that initial encounter. You're going to knock on the door. So it's pri that you're, you're, you know, their privacy is important. You're going to sit while you talk so they think you're there a long time. And you're going to repeat things back. You're going to ask, why are you, you know, can I help you today? You know, what, are you in any pain? Here's what I'm hearing from you. The other thing when you want to communicate well, when you, you want to get sort of the, make sure that you're communicating carefully, I mentioned this before, not to do it when you're stressed, but the reality is we are always stressed. You need to figure out ways at work to de-stress yourself. You've got to find some sort of tool or some sort of trick or something that you do to de-stress yourself. The reality is, I have to tell you, with what we do, there are times where you need to be at the bedside, someone is dying, you need to be there and be there this second. But there are often times where you can take two minutes or five minutes and just go take a stroll. Just go decompress. There, it is, we, for some reason, we are on this completely weird mental state of oh, you have to be just going crazy busy all the time at your absolute maximum effort. No, you don't. No, you don't. You have plenty of time to take a two minutes here, three minutes there. If you're getting, you can feel yourself getting stressed out. Pay, you know, pay attention to your body. Your body tells you that. Watch those signals and then de-escalate it for yourself so that you can communicate well with someone. You don't put off the, right, the wrong kind of vibe to people. Really important. That's important. Finding a way to de-stress de yourself is key. So staying calm under pressure, you're going to do things like stop and collect your thoughts. You're going to do those pauses we talked about. You're going to stop and on purpose take time. You're going to pick your words carefully. You're going to make one point. You're going to summarize and wrap it up. You're not going to go crazy with the staying, you know, to stay calm under pressure. And if you find, so I don't know how many of you meditate. I meditate. I love meditation. I think it's an awesome thing. One of the things you do when you you meditate, one of the things you can do is what's called a body scan, where you spend a little bit of time and you focus on where in your body you feel something. A little bit of twinge of this, a little pain there, a little tension there, because it, it's your body telling you things aren't quite right right now. So you can do, basically, you feel this straight pain in your shoulders, if you're getting a little bit of a headache, if you just are kind of, you can feel your palms are sweaty, you're tachycardic, take some time, de-stress. Don't bang your head on a table. Okay, do not do it. Why would you do that? Don't do that. Do something else. So we have, we have in our emergency department, out on our ambulance bay, we have this really cool kind of um, garden-y area that during the spring is blooms jasmine. It smells incredible. So you can go from this chaotic, crazy ER and literally spend three minutes outside with your eyes closed smelling this beautiful jasmine, and it just changes everything. 
we have aromatherapy stuff that people can use in the ER. We put them in our dock box. It's like, and the guys have totally gotten into this. It's so great. They're like, oh, I need lavender. I, I need lavender today. Oh no, I need, I need lemongrass today. It's a riot. It works great. Whatever you need to de-stress, please do it. Please do it. And remember, unless somebody's actively dying, you have time. Please take the time. Now, when it comes to specific patient situations, there are things that will help you. So in these specific situations, going from, from beginning to end of the patient encounter, there are things that you can do and phrases that you can do and sort of actions you can take that will help you at each point in the patient encounter. So everything in red here is nonverbal. So on your first encounter with a patient, watch them. How do they look? When we do the oral board exam in emergency medicine, one of the things that we do, it's a totally weird situation. So people show up for their oral board exam. It's in a hotel room in Chicago. They're given a piece of paper that says, here's the patient's sort of information. And one of the things that they will ask at the beginning of the encounter is, what do I see when I walk in the room? Make that part of what you actually pay attention to what you see. How is the patient sitting? Is the patient fully clothed? Is the patient not clothed? Is the patient pacing? Is the patient lying there totally still? And not just medically. This is how you're going to communicate. So what do they look like? Are they quiet? Are they agitated? What's the nonverbal thing happening here? And then let them just tell you why they're there. You know, why, can, can I help you today? What, what's the, what can I do to help you here in the ER today? And let them say in their own words why they're there. Very, very helpful to kind of get you launched. Don't plant words in their mouth. It'll give you an idea of where to go with this history. And remember, they're there. Why are they there? They're worried. They think they have a bad disease. They need their prescription filled. They're having pain. At, figure out that there's something that's uncomfortable that they're there for. Acknowledge that. Gosh, I'm so sorry you're in pain. Let me address that for you. It sounds like you're really concerned about your having a stroke. We'll look into that. Let me do an exam and we'll see about that. So address it right away and it de-escalates the sort of the tension that they have. It's very, very useful. Introduce yourself and always start out with I'm sorry about the weight if they've never waited at all you still start with that and then always address pain at the beginning that breaks that barrier down and now you're ready to go one of the other things to do routinely as far as good phrases to have in the ER good approaches is the Disney approach so you know when you go to the Dis Disneyland and you are in whatever ginormous gigantic line they will have these little things you know for 45 minutes from this point 30 minutes from this point, estimated wait time before you even walk in the line in the first place, you know, two hours and 30 minutes, whatever it happens to be, do that in the ER. But you know when they say that, on purpose, Disney adds time. So it says two hours and 30 minutes, but you make it to the ride in two hours and 10 minutes, it's like, scored! I mean, who would God's earth would on really stand in line for two hours and 10 minutes, but you feel like you won for standing in line for two hours and 10 minutes because they overestimate when you start. Do the same thing in the ER tend to overestimate how long people are going to be there. So you address their concerns. You say, here's where I think, I think we'll be able to get you out in a couple of hours when you know it's only going to take one. So people have an idea of what's, what they're in store for, and you kind of paint the picture rosily. Now, once a patient's been hanging out in the ER for a while, I, there's things called touchstone or drive-by encounters. I, I used to use drive-by, but that's kind of not a good term. So touchstone encounters, where you on purpose, as you're running around the ER, stick your head in the room. Okay, you actually go ahead and on purpose, people know that you're interested in them. They know you're attentive. And you're going to basically take a peek in there. How do they look? Are they content and happy reading their book or crocheting? Awesome. Are they pacing and standing at the door? Not so good. Something's up. Do they look sick now where they didn't look sick before? Take a look, nonverbal. Ask them how they're doing. You know, how are you doing? Any concern? Anything changed? You doing all right? Anything I can get you? Ask about their concern. Again, there's the verbal communication. And then if they bring something up, address it. You know, I, I, I didn't realize they've already taken you to x-ray and you've been back and you've been back here 45 minutes. I am so sorry. Let me get on that right away. I'm going to go find out what that x-ray is right away. Or I wanted to see if you're feeling better. You're feeling better. Oh, you're not. Gosh, you know, if you're have, still having pain, let us know. We can fix that. We'll address that. So make sure you, uh, I just wanted to stick my head in here and keep you informed. Just waiting for your labs. Life is good. Those are very helpful for, making, for communicating in the ER. It makes people happy. It makes your Prisgany scores go crazy. Keeping people informed is key, so make sure that they know that, and use your effective nonverbal communication. Wave from across the room, smile, make sure that they know that you're still attentive. Now, when you get to the discharge point, you know this, right? We've all done this. You're in the room, you're saying, Everything, here's what's happening, it's really great, I'm going to give a prescription, just see your doctor in a couple of days, it's going to be fine, and if they're still looking puzzled, something's not right yet. So you need to ask them, you know, have I answered all your questions? Is there anything else you'd like to ask me? Anything else you'd like to tell me? Because that will, I'll tell you, that'll save you the things like at the, oh, by the way, does it make any, make any difference if I've been having black stools lately? 
It's like, oh my God, we're ready to discharge you, and now you tell me about the black stools. It helps to actually dress all of that stuff up front. So listen to how they receive stuff, and then give them an opening to ask you questions. There are specific patients we know communication is difficult or problematic. The angry and demanding patient, first of all, that is where you need to find your zen place. It sets everyone off, right? The person, you go in and you're already on the defensive because they're pissed off or they're asking for something you don't think you can deliver. I want an MRI. My doctor said I can get an MRI on my knee and they sent me here. It's like, oh, geez. Okay, you already know it's going to be a problem. Watch them to see non-verbally how they're doing. They may not be as mad as their verbal sounds. If they're saying, you know, I demanded an MRI, but they're kind of hanging out in the, in the chair, that doesn't match, okay? That's not, they're maybe not as mad as their voice sounds. If they're verbally confrontative, no, be prepared for that, okay, remember, and remember it's not about you, they're frustrated with something, something in the system, it's, it is virtually never about you unless you've done something on purpose that's pissed them off. So you have some things you can say, like, boy, I can really sense you're frustrated, I really can sense that, tell me more, explain to me, you know, tell me a little bit more so I can see how I can help you best, or the, the, this phrase, I don't like this phrase a lot, out of concern for you. That sounds like some eighth floor, you know, C-suite person coming down talking. It's like, eh, I don't like crazy about that one. If you have somebody who's demanding something you can't give them, give them options. You know, I would, I would love to be able to give you an MRI today, but honestly, we just don't do MRIs and knees in the ER. It's just not something that we usually do, we, but we can certainly arrange that as an outpatient. I will do my best to facilitate that, and I know you're uncomfortable, so let me give you something for the discomfort in the meantime. Here are the options. Here's what we can do. Make it a win-win. It's a yes-yes. Always apologize for the wait, even if it was absolutely nothing, and, and say, and I'm here for you now. I, boy, I'm so sorry you've been waiting two and a half hours. I'd be upset too, but you know what? I'm here now. Let's, my attention is fully on you, so let's figure out what's wrong with you. Let me see how I can help you the best today. And if somebody's really angry, say, just acknowledge it. Boy, I see that you're really upset. I can see that you're really angry. Can you basically share the concerns you're having with me? Because maybe I can fix things. Maybe I can address, if it's a systems issue, maybe I can fix that. So share it with me. Let, be on the same, same team with them. Have them work. And then a few other things you can use as far as phrases. The other patient that can take a boatload of your time is the anxious patient. The person that just, they, they really are sure they have something that you, you haven't tested for. Or maybe your results are normal, but can't I still have such and such? They're just really, really anxious. And this is the person that doesn't look at you. This is the person that's like looking at the floor, looking at the ceiling, and they're just super, super anxious. And they tend to be like this, right? You've seen them. They tend to be kind of closed posture. They may be reticent. They may not be saying anything. Or they may be super, super talkative. Either one ends up taking your time to make sure you're doing the right thing. And this can be very demanding of your time and frustrating for you to try to convey the information. And they're either just not getting it or they're super anxious and taking your time. So address it flat out. Boy, I see you're really worried that you're having a stroke. I can, I can really see that. I see your concern. But let me put, you at my, it put your mind at ease. Here's what I've done on your exam. See, what, remember when I did that on your exam? That was perfectly normal. And when it's normal, I feel so much better that I don't have to worry about a stroke for you anymore. You can actually address it flat out. You can just talk to them flat out about it. The other thing is, one thing very frustrating for the anxious person, um, or the, the sort of person that's just really freaked out to be in the ER, is when we don't come up with a diagnosis. And that happens a lot. Okay, we come up with no diagnosis between 20 and 30% of the time, depending on what the complaint happens to be. We may not know what's wrong. In that case, it's frustrating for that anxious person to hear that. I don't have an answer for you today. But you have ways you can tell them that. You can say, you know what's kind of cool? I don't have a final diagnosis, but what I can tell you right now is this, this, and this aren't happening. Okay, the tests on these things are completely normal. And what's kind of cool is you have a doctor who can follow you, and we're here 24-7. You can always come back if, you have an, if something changes or you have another concern. I anticipate you'll be fine. I think this is going to go away and it's going to be just fine. But if it isn't, we're always here. So you can get kind of get them calmer that way. Those are phrases that help you with the anxious patient. The other group of communication, area of communication in the ER that's vitally important is talking to consultants. And I'll tell you, people who haven't practiced a lot, I see this a lot in the young learners I teach, the residents I teach early on. The temptation, especially, so for advanced practice clinicians, I think this applies especially if you're young or you're new in your job, is the temptation is to overcompensate and, and basically dump a huge amount of information on, the te on a telephone call to a consultant. That isn't what they want to hear. Imagine yourself on the other end of the phone. So you're the consultant and you're busy and you're getting a call from, oh my God, the ER. What you want to hear as the consultant is, what do you need from me and when do you need it? So couch all of your consultant conversations that way. Introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Dr. Barenbarmer. I'm in, on, on an, in the ER today. 
um, I'm taking care of a patient in the ER with such and such, and then you get to the point. I have a 26-year-old here in the emergency department has appendicitis. It's confirmed by CT. I need you to come on down, and, and you know, you're on call, so you know, do you want me to just admit the patient, or you want to take the patient right to the OR? Or um, I only need to follow up for you. Okay? They love that, by the way. If you can call and say, I just need you to follow up on this patient as the first thing out of your mouth, they instantly de-escalate. All that defensiveness on their part goes away, and you can just say, I just need you to follow up. The patient has a na nasal fracture. They really want to see a plastic surgeon. Can you just see him in a week to 10 days? I don't anticipate any complications. Absolutely, I'm call my office. It's all good to go. Click. Done. Cut to the chase when you're dealing with consultants. Don't, and if they want more information, give them more information. But you don't have to spew out everything from the get-go. Do not waste their time. It pisses them off. And it actually wastes your time, too. Sometimes you don't need to do that. There are a couple of pages here of key phrases that you can use. There's a couple that basically are things not to say that you may have as part of your lexicon, that there's nice alternatives you can use that basically don't put people on the defensive, make you seem open. I'm gonna let you read these on your own. I don't have to read them to you. There's several pages of these. And then the last few things before we kind of wrap up this talk. One of the other things that's very good in communicating within your me medical team is what's called managing up. So when you go into the room and you introduce yourself, hi, I'm Dr. Bierenbaumer, I'm gonna be taking care of you today, I wanna make sure we get your pain addressed up front, you having any pain, no, great, um, and I wanna kinda hear why you're here today and what, you, you know, what I can do the best to help you. And you know what? You have Gonzalo here, who's one of the best nurses we have in the ER. You are so lucky. He's such a great nurse. This is wonderful. Talk up. Start it from the get-go. People feel safe in that environment. It helps your team feel like upbeat, and it's wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful to do. And when you basically transfer care, it's also critical to be clear on that. So I'm leaving now. I, I wanna, I'm going to come in, you know, ER shift work, and I, I think you're really good to go. A couple things are pending. I've spoken to Dr. Smith, who's coming on for me. They're going to basically be taking over, and here's all we're waiting for. Your CT scan, I've told him about your chest pain, told him about your belly pain. He's got a, all on board. He's going to check your CT scan and wrap things up for you. It is a bad practice, and it's tempting, and a lot of us do it, to basically at the end of your shift, clock out and leave without talking to the patients that are still in the pipeline. If something goes wrong in there, first of all, sign-outs are an area of... of risk and if something goes wrong in there the patient's going to say well the, pa the 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 person never came back to tell me what was wrong and then this thing went wrong and now it's not a great deal so it really is a very helpful practice to just run by each room just like you had been doing your little touchstone things run by each room and say gosh you know it's time for my shift to be over i have a great person coming on to take over they know everything about you and all we're waiting for is this done makes them happy really happy the other thing to not do which is sometimes really hard, especially if you have a jerk of a consultant, is to not say something disparaging about another practitioner. So say you go to the bedside and somebody it clearly was mismanaged by somebody else in another ER or somebody, one of your colleagues in the ER, or by their doctor in the office. It was like, wow, that was just not a great case. Never, ever say anything to the patient about that up front until you know why whatever happened happened. Don't do it. Really don't make disparaging comments. That is a setup for plaintiff's attorneys. They love that. They absolutely love that. And uh, give feedback to your colleague. Oh, so another, this last thing I think is important. It was actually it was a New Year's resolution of mine years ago. It was basically call people out on inappropriate behavior. So if you have a colleague who's really being unprofessional in the ER, you need to call that out. Now, you can either do it in front of other people, which puts them on the defensive, not always a great idea, but sometimes effective, or just pull them aside and say, you know, honestly, having you yell in the emergency department is just not an appropriate behavior here. You know, we're all professionals. I respect you. I expect you to respect me, and that's just not appropriate behavior here. So I would appreciate you treating me as a colleague, and let's talk about this rationally without yelling. So find it, call it out, because if you don't, especially learners in the, in the area are going to think that's okay. They're going to think that's fine, or you're just not going to, that's going to be behavior that continues on in that individual. So a couple rules of thumb. Don't escalate the problem. Be compassionate and empathetic. Pick your battles. Certain things aren't worth fighting over, and make sure you separate the person from the issue. If it's a, it is not the person that's necessarily the problem. It may be a systems issue, so separate them. A few other things that are in here. One last thing I want to mention is the EHR. The reality is all of us spend extra time at the end of a shift to catch up on that stupid EHR. I, it has positives, but I tell you, the EHR makes me insane to fill out what needs to be done. If you decide that you're going to log on and get into your work in the, in the room with the patient, basically tell them what you're doing. 
Okay, I am listening to you. It makes, you know, I'm going to be over here making sure that I type exactly what it is you're telling me. Patients don't like it, by the way. So, but get them in on this. And if, they, if you have a computer, you can actually show them things. Show them an x-ray. They have no idea what the x-ray really shows. But show them the x-ray. Point it out and say, you know, here's your fracture. Or this is a, here's your chest x-ray. Here's your heart. Isn't that cool? Then the, then the computer ends up being not something that's a divider. It ends up something that actually unites you together. I love these books. They're the perfect phrases books. And you can get these on Amazon, or you can get these anywhere you want to. There's, and they, there are a gajillion of them, depending on the situation. I love these. If you're really running into trouble dealing with, let's say, conflicts, there's a couple of books out there that are wonderful on this. And these two books, I highly recommend you get. One's called Crucial Confrontations, the other's called Crucial Conversations. And they talk about how to deal with these sticky situations that we're in every day, all the time. It's wonderful when it's how to break them down and how to kind of figure out how to deal with all these sticky situations that we deal with. I am done. It has been delightful to be here with you guys. I'm so glad you're here. Please feel free to email, email me if you need to. And I please, what I beg of you is give us feedback on this course. If there are things you think we're missing, things that we didn't cover the way you want it to, things you, please let us know. We really honestly morph this course every single time based on your feedback. Thank you very much. I have a plane to catch. It's been lovely. Thank you.